it looks like some of you have gotten a, a head start on the CCR English Language Arts Standards and are aware of the shift in thinking that that entails. And five of you are already expert on analytic and holistic rubrics. So during that time, when we're discussing that, feel free to go get a soda or a nice cool glass of water. What I thought we would start with is a little bit of an overview of rubrics. And I'll be asking questions in the chat pod. Uh, so for right now, you can be giving me your you know, your checks over in that uh, Susan just showed you, or if I ask you for something in the chat pod itself, uh, just run me through. And I just point out what Catherine said in case you didn't see in the, uh, because we are recording, um, everyone is aware that all of their chats uh, will be seen. And if you do want to privately chat with somebody, you're able to do that. Um, Susan, it's up at the top, right? At the, the top of the chat pod start a chat with someone else if you wanted to have a discussion. Okay. Um, so if you want to have a private chat okay. with someone, you just need to select their name under participants and it, one of the top um, icon is start private chat. Okay, okay great. You can, you can do it from either side. That's why I was, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at our goals for today because hopefully one of them or more connects with what you're hoping to, to get out of our time together. Uh, we're going to be exploring the workings of the analytic rubric and its relationship to learners' college and career readiness. Rubrics are phenomenal for helping learners grasp the higher level thinking that goes into learning, just learning in general. And if we can share the rubric creation process as well as the just the use of rubrics in the classroom, it, it's an almost automatic pathway to learners thinking more deeply about what they're doing. And that is one of the shifts in college and career readiness standards. We bringing uh, an awareness of the complexity of learning and information and an ability to organize that complexity so that it's not complicated, but we can delve more deeply into concepts. And I think I think we are really at the place in the 21st century to start doing that. And I know a lot of us have been thinking about this for a long time. So it seems like, for ESL anyway, it seems like a great match. Of course, we have the issue, which is coming up in the next goal, which is how do we create these rubrics so that they're appropriate to learners who have limited English language or are growing their English language skills. And so we're going to be identifying those steps, and then we're going to analyze an ESL team task because I think as a group, if we, rubrics are wonderful because they do create uh, a connection from class to class, from teacher to teacher, between what the expectations are, uh, especially at the same level and also from level to level. So we're going to work together to identify the dimensions of a task and insert them in a rubric as best we can within the time frame. And then along the way, I'll be providing some management strategies that support the use of rubrics. That's kind of that. So uh, I see that there's uh, an issue with the audio. Can I can I get a green check if everyone is hearing me okay? And if you're not, um, why don't you? Okay. I I saw that for someone it was going in and out. This is one of the issues with the webinar. It's important for us to check in on that. Okay. Looks like most of I'm I'm hearing an echo now. I think so. All right. Let me know in the chat pod if you hear anything. It's better if you don't private chat me on that because. Uh, okay. What's I am hearing somebody else's mic. Let's see how we are doing now. OK, I'm going to dismiss everybody's uh, status, and we'll keep going. Clear the status. Su Susan, would you clear the status for me? I'm having a little trouble. There, I got it. OK. Along with, OK, Jenny, the checks are in the left-hand side. Um, you, actually, you go to the little man with his hand raised up at the top. 
a very on the very top bar and you drop down and there's there are things to check. I will do the best I can to stay as even as I can, but I'm not moving my head a lot, so I'm not sure how else to help. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to manage. I know that audio is a very annoying if it doesn't work well. So in terms of the goals that we have, I set those. But I think it's really important that the more and more we do professional development, we have to think about the inquiry concept, because inquiry is why we come in the first place. And, and to say that we will achieve X by X amount of time, especially in a 60-minute webinar, is really not as realistic as saying, we're on this pathway uh, inquiring about these things. So throughout this next hour, let's think about the skills we're assessing in an ESL collaborative team task. What are the, the root skills? And then knowing that, what when are rubrics useful in assessing those skills? Not every task deserves a rubric, and that's very important to realize. And then we have to think about who's doing the measuring. You know, is this a self-assessment, or is this an instruction, instructor assessment? Very often, if it's summative, it's helpful if it's the instructor, because the instructor is going to have a score to work from. But certainly informative, it's very good for the learners to be doing the self-assessment. And I actually do both for formative and summative. But it's something to consider. And then when we're thinking about college and career readiness and the tools our learners need to function at a high level in academic and workplace settings, how does the rubric support that? OK, here's your first task. You've got nine seconds now that I've got it up. See if you can fill that in mentally. You don't have to work in the chat pod. See if you can complete this definition. You can jot it down. It's going to fill in automatically in another five seconds. Maybe another two seconds. There we go. <laughs> OK. Take a look at the actual definition. Uh, this is by Heidi Andrade. Would you give yourselves a check or a Y in the, you can check in the um, attendee pod, or you can give me a Y in the chat pod if that's easier, if you got a definition or terms that are close to what are here. Mimi, I think your raised hand means yes. OK, it looks like you were right on target, so I don't need to spend a lot of time going over this. I think the most important thing to remember, the words here are clearly the ones that are uh, underlined. Evaluation, measurement, performance, and task, although perform, I like vaguely. Vaguely works. These are other things to consider. Rubrics are very special because they're about the quality of work. It's really, it's a way of creating a quantitative view of a qualitative task. The purpose is to make the intangible of concepts of quality accessible to learners. I did not write these things. I, I will tell you who wrote them, but I think they're just, just wonderful little jewels about rubrics. Um, a quality rubric is the result of defining and expectations. This is something I think you'll find as you go through and create the rubrics. It is such an incredible tool for refining our instruction and being clear on what we're expecting from the learners, which of course is an academic and workplace uh, setting correlation. And they are some a tool the students can use metacognitively, reflecting and improving their and this is from Kathy Schrock's How Do We Define Quality Rubrics. It's an entire wiki. It's listed in the handout. There'll be a, uh, the handout is going to be in the ECOP, I thought, rather than put it in the uh, webinar today. We'll just have a link to go right to the ECOP form and be able to download out. But the handout that you got and the pre-webinar had uh, her in the bibliography, and it's an incredible resource. I highly recommend it. 
So here's an example of a rubric. And I chose uh, a mixer because I think we don't tend to assess a mixer so much. Uh, we're going to really be talking about team tasks, but I thought this would be a way of showing you one style of rubric. And this rubric has, uh, it has a label. And then on the right-hand side, it has descriptions of what that label or level indicates. So I've thought about what the, yes, Susan, all the, every rubric that you're seeing on here, you have uh, in the, you'll have in the, the handout. And then, of course, you have access as well to the PowerPoint. But the first thing we need to do is think about what the lowest level would be. And this is really terrific for the, um, differentiated instruction. And then we want to think about the highest level. So in this case, I've gone with the term expert. And if you, when we look at this more closely in a moment, you'll see that this is an expansion of what happened in the beginning level. I, 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 I had the, the learner becoming more sophisticated in his or her use of the language during the mixer. However, let's take a look at the whole thing. And you can see that there are a lot of different elements here. There's responding. There is asking the questions. There's uh, clarification with spelling. And there's what I'm calling networking, you know, thanking the classmate or making eye contact in the course of the process that So you might actually want to make use of a different kind of rubric, which is this style. And in this style, you still have the labels or the levels up across the top. But instead of there being one dimension and the one descriptor for the whole uh, concept, the dimensions of the task are broken down. So we have responding to questions, asking questions, checking, spelling, networking. And if you just look across, let's just look at the top one. If you just look across at responding to questions, you can see that in this mixer, which was asking, do you like to study? You know, do you like to study at night? Do you like to uh, go to the movies? I'm making this up as we talk, but it, you know, it's basically a do you like substitution drill hidden within a mixer. The students who are able to, the, the competent student is able to respond, yes, I do, or no, I don't, to a do you like question. The beginning student or the student, and that doesn't mean beginning level. This is just a label that's instead of saying, uh, you're just not as good as everyone else. But here, you know, you're starting out. You're a novice. You can respond yes or no. If I had a fourth column, which would provide the student with no points, um, and no, no label, or something that said um, help, that would be no response. So that's just an example of two different types of rubrics. Because in my subtle way, I thought it would be good to show you something. Uh, no, Susan, it's really not a good idea. What I usually say is uh, no score. And that way, they know they can go back and they can improve their score. But scoring rubrics and uh, analytic rubrics and holistic rubrics are a little bit different. A scoring rubric, you're definitely putting the point scores in there. The ones I'm showing you today, we're not really talking about scores as much. Scores are very important for summative, but not as important for holistic. So here you see the two types of rubrics. And those five of you that knew uh, the rubrics already, already had labeled them. And the, there are four parts to a rubric. Ready? Part one the name of the assignment, the task, the project. Um, you, you decide what, what you, uh, the activity could be as well. You decide what the name of what it is you're assessing would be. I've been using the term task quite a bit. So in this case, both the analytic and the holistic have, they have the identification of what it is we're assessing. Then they have a scale or levels, or in some cases, they're called labels. So you can see that these both have labels, levels. And then they, the dimensions are specific to the analytic rubric. So that breaks the task down. But both the analytic and the holistic have what we call descriptors. Now, one of the things you can do with the holistic rubric is set those descriptors with checkboxes, because 
when you look at the beginning level on that uh, descriptive, let's look at the competent level because that makes it easier. Uh, Chris, we already asked Nancy to do that. Um, on the competent level, you see two distinct types of skills. If I wanted to score the student and the student only did the first uh, skill, responding to the answer, but they could not use a prompt to create a question. They needed to be able to read the questions. They're falling between beginning and competent. So that actually is the downside of the holistic rubric. The holistic rubric is fabulous for us as instructors to plan what we expect the student to do at each level. But in terms of clarity for the student and feedback for the student, I happen to be a fan of analytics. And here you see an exa uh, some examples of the uh, drawbacks and benefits. Just give you a moment to write something in the chat pod about which one you prefer based on what you just saw. Want me to go back for a second? I sure will. I'm going to go back for a second, everybody, and then you'll, based on Susan. You're going to see a lot more of these, Susan, but is that okay? So here we go. Leslie, I see that you have your hand raised. I'm not sure if that uh, means that, that you have a question. If you would type it in the chat pod. One of the things that is so fabulous about having a chat pod is that we now have a record of everyone's concepts about analytic and holistic, and we'll be sending this information, actually we'll be putting it on the electronic community of practice, so you'll be able to, if you can't read everybody's input at this point, it'll give you get it um, and absorb it a little bit more. I see some really great points, which is the issue of time. The holistic is a lot faster to develop than the analytic, but the analytic is uh, really easier to, to, it's more suited to formative, uh, and it really gives the student more feedback. <laughs> and Sharon, you're right, that time consuming. But this is where, uh, and I have to go back and look at uh, an Elizabeth's idea of using both one for pre and one for, for post is a terrific way to come in. But again, you've got that one issue of the learner who falls between one one uh, level and another, and no clear concept of why. So it's important to create check boxes within that holistic, uh, within those holistic descriptors, so that you can see where the student is falling. And one of the things that we're not talking about today, but I think is very important to bring up, is rubrics for writing assignments. Rubrics are phenomenal for writing. We are really talking about performance-based uh, speaking and listening tasks, because those so often are challenging to assess, and we tend not to assess them so formally. Uh, but I think it's very important to consider that. Uh, Elizabeth has put that up in the chat pod as well. Uh, San Diego Community, Adult, uh, Community College District has a writing rubric. Uh, CASAS has a great writing rubric. So there, there are a lot of resources for writing rubrics. And Quinn. Um, I'll, Elizabeth Quinn is asking about getting a copy of the Palo Alto School Rubric, and Catherine, this is the perfect place for us to uh, point out how wonderful the electronic community of practice is going to be for us, because it will be open. It's going to start officially on September 19th, and I'll talk to you more about that in a moment, but it will be an opportunity where we can exchange rubrics and tools that we're using. Okay. Let's talk for a minute about why we're even doing this. Reveal a little mystery. I'm sure that all of you are very aware of the CASAS listening tests, the ability to test listening using a multiple choice test, 
the ability to test reading using a multiple choice test. But what do you do when you want to test, key, you, know, you want to assess soft skills, or you want to talk about pair work or collaboration or small group or tasks? I think that we need to be aware that there, there is a tool that works for us in this way. And so my first mystery revealed to you today is that we can use a rubric. And let's talk about why for a moment, because we are adult learners and we need the why. Rubrics are performance-based. And in ESL, uh, we do a lot of performance-based uh, teaching and learning. So our learners are doing role plays. Our learners are doing uh, brainstorms. Our learners are working in groups to create posters. So the rubric is a performance-based tool. It's also a guide for the group. So if you have the rubric ahead of time, you can see what the expectations are for your group. This indicates that the learners are going to be able to interpret the rubric. So that's where our work comes in. Yes, and welcome, Elise. Rubrics are also authentic, as I'm sure you know, Elizabeth is, is aware from the workplace standpoint. And all of you would know that you know, we, we see rubrics maybe not um, in the grid form, but we, we see rubrics a lot in our lives as assessment work that we do, certainly in the work that our learners do. In addition, and this is, I think, one of the best things, varied proficiencies in a group can be addressed fairly. So you saw that I had beginning competent and expert, but there's no reason why I couldn't have three different actual levels of learners so that the learners would see what their expectations were, but they could also aspire to a higher level in an area of the rubric, a dimension of the rubric where they were. And then for me, this is probably the most important. When you have an assessment that is a concrete tool, you are telling the learner your time in the group is important. Your time working in a team, your time working on these. So can we all say gravitas to the group? And last but not least, the rubrics are formative. They ins the, the rubric inspires, the task inspires the rubric. The rubric then refines the task. You know, when you see that the learners are not able to do one whole dimension of the task, that informs your instruction, but it also then informs the task. Maybe it will simplify. Or if everybody is just breezing through on a certain level, maybe you need to add more challenge. Here's an example of a rubric that I developed as part of a links discussion. There's, it's still in the draft stage, but and, and uh, Miriam Burt, for those of you who know Miriam Burt, uh, I had given the exceeds criteria as uh, I gave 100% attention. And Miriam Burt said, that is completely unrealistic. No one is going to give 100% attention. Now, I. I disagree with Miriam. Would you just put a Y in the chat bot if you're giving this webinar 100% attention? Just kidding. Okay. So notice that the differentiation between exceeding the criteria and meeting the criteria is that in this case, we have the students taking notes. Now, that is a CCR skill if there ever was one. But it may not be what the criteria is in our classes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Uh, I know webinars are fantastic for multitasking. If I asked you all what, uh, yes, I put in almost, Bronca, because Miriam made me. But if I asked you all what else you're doing, I'm sure we'd have a very interesting conversation. Let's not go there. <laughs> and, and, and Debbie, if I understand that we're going to be moving quickly, so all of this will be available for you. when you don't have words. I should have that as a dimension, words. So these are some dimensions that I chose to look at for everyday performance in a classroom. You know, I, I really want the students to be able to identify whether they're focusing or not. I really want them to identify that collaboration is important. I want them to see that time management is important. I probably should swap time management and use of target language. But I'm going to put this in our 
electronic community practice in September, and we're going to, together, see what kinds of things we want to add or change, because rubrics are meant to be collaborative between instructors. And so we'll have an opportunity to do that together. So here are a few more mysteries revealed. The steps in creating a rubric are to reflect, list, group and label, and apply. What we're going to be seeing in the next few minutes is a lot of text. No way you're going to take in all the text. A rubric webinar, by its very nature, is a text-heavy experience. My expectations for you are that you will let the information, the, the, the gist, you will take in the gist, and the details will be available to you both in the handout and in our discussions in the electronic community practice. But just so you get a little gisty, the reflection stage is the most important stage of the rubric development. You need to be thinking about why you are selecting the task, what's happened before that you want to address in terms of expectations for the learners, how does it relate to the lesson, what skills do learners need, what exactly is the task, what evidence can learners provide that they accomplished the task, and what are your highest or best or worst expectations for the outcome. I always love going to catastrophic. The worst expectations are great fun. But you can see why rubrics, whether they're holistic or analytic, take your time. Because you need to be thinking about what is it that's the outcome? What, you know, and what goes into creating that outcome? So this is our opportunity to think very deeply about a mixer or a brainstorm. But they can become general rubrics. Once you create it, the content doesn't have to be specific. You can slot in certain things. And that's, I think, uh, a time saver for us in ESL. And the questions are great, and they're, they're um, cited from Stevens and Levy uh, Introduction to Rubrics. And I do have that uh, at the front of that. The next part is to start listing. After you've reflected, you start listing the various objectives for the task. Right. But what students will be able to do is, is one element of it, but this is pulling it apart, Sharon. It's really, it's really identifying the dimensions. Um, so you're looking at the language skills. You're looking at the support skills, yes. But now you're adding in the cooperative soft skills, the metacognitive skills. I put in digital literacy because I think that's very important. Um, you might want to put in academic vocabulary specifically. Uh, so it's, oh, um, students will be able to, Debbie. It's the, the, the opening law uh, phrase for a uh, communicative learning objective. After you've done the listing, then you go to grouping and labeling. So you think about how do the elements and objectives of the task, as well as performance expectations, relate to each other. So I see that collaborate got thrown out. But I'm starting with this idea of a team brainstorm. I want them to be able to collaborate to create a list. Notice I've left off the content here, because it could be on many different types of things. I'm aware that they're going to need to use imperatives to do this. My worst case is that one person dominates and they go off topic. My best case is that all team members speak and they stay on topic. And so this is all the type of, of synthetic, synthetic, that's not what I want to say, synthesizing that I need to do in order to start creating my rubric. And my last step, ta-da, is to apply it. So then I sort the lists and labels into the rubric. My dimensions on the left, my um, labels up at the top, and my descriptors under each column. And again, if you prefer the holistic rubric, then what you would do is you would combine the content editing and participation descriptors into one field and under exceeds expectations. And then you do the same thing for the meets expectations. I break it out just so that it's a little easier for me. OK, on a scale of 1 to 10, now let's do 1 to 5. That's easier. On a scale of 1 to 5, how sticky was that information? Five being very sticky, I feel like it's, you know, it's there. One being not so much, I'm going to need to think about this a lot more. Let's see. Put your numbers in the chat pod.
okay, it's looking like we're we're not at five, which is exactly what I would expect and and would hope that by the time we now go to um, the practice, some of the concepts will become a little stickier. One of the reasons that you want your learners to actually help you create rubrics is so that it is very sticky to them, that they do understand what it is you're working with. And so if, for example, you were going to have the learners create a map of the classroom, they're going to work together to map out the classroom, you would ask the learners, what's important? What, you know, what, what, is the, what would the best map look like? Or what are the things I want to see in the map or you want to see in the map? Um, so they would get to things like uh, you know, good color and accuracy and maybe not those words, but uh, neat. And so once they start developing those dimensions, you can have them go through this process with you at a very rudimentary level. So let's go to the practice, and then I'll show you some more samples. Okay, we're going to start with a great picture. By the way, there is a, a, an entire series of these in Google. I don't know if you've seen them or not, but they, they made me laugh a lot. And I picked the most adult one for all of them. So uh, the task is, and I, I'm sure most of us have done this, that, so you see the task over on the left-hand side, uh, and let me make sure it's long enough. Uh, learners will collaborate on a list of interview do's and don'ts and present and demonstrate two items from the list, their list to the class. Yes. <laughs> Elizabeth, the picture or the task? Let's not go there. So I'm obviously, in order to be able to uh, for the learners to do this, I can approach it from a variety of angles. If I'm doing task-based learning, I may not do an entire presentation on the do's and don'ts. I might have the learners actually develop this using resources, and you know, there's, there are a number of ways to go through this. I could start certainly by prompting the concept of do's and don'ts using an image. And, and uh, just Google do's and don'ts for interviews, and you'll see a whole series of, uh, with this guy. So let's take a look first. I'm going to pull this okay. So what do you see? Oh, this is reflection two. Let me get reflection one. <laughs> what is the purpose of this assignment? I'll, I'll take the first five people who type in the chat pod. Looking at this assignment, looking at this task, what is the purpose? So Natalia is typing, Rana is typing. Okay, Susan, you're commenting on the picture. I am thinking more that we would look at the task on the left hand side. The picture was to prompt you to the concept of do's and don'ts. Uh, so some of you are writing in the chat pod. I, I need uh, Lori and Rana and uh, Natalia have written in the, uh, the reflection chat pod. Let's see if we can get two more people to write. OK, good. We've got Alex and Ashley writing over here. So let's take a look at what they had to say. Elizabeth. So we have Natalia says, the purpose of this task is to prepare for a job interview. And Rana says, to help the applicant succeed in the interview. Uh, Lori says, the purpose is to find out what students know. Elizabeth says, we can see whether students have grasped the essential of the lesson. Alex is saying, it's to measure students' knowledge of appropriate and inappropriate interview behavior. Ashley is looking at gaps in students' knowledge. Nancy is learning what an interview is and how to be, no, she's not learning it. She's having students learn what an interview is and how to behave in one. And Sissy is saying to, draw, to work together as a team. Well, I feel like breath mint candy mint. I mean, this is why we have to do this. Because if we're going towards Natalia and Rana's point of view, and it's really about the success in the job interview, 
then that's probably more about the content than it is about what Cece is suggesting or maybe what Lori is suggesting in terms of finding out what learners know. So we might actually talk more about the interaction in the team. So we need to, be, we just need to think about this. I mean, that's really what the bottom line is. We look at that and we say, okay, the purpose of the assignment, and in, in my mind, because it says collaborate, I, the purpose of the assignment is very much linked in to learners working together to create and teach about the do's and don'ts of the interview process. Yes. Now, Stephen, the, that was in terms of the picture, specifically. So I think, I'm, I'm hoping that, that by just doing this little tiny assignment, you can see how important it is to, to think about what the purpose is. Because then, you know, that's, that then is going to influence how you write your rubric. Underneath the task, you see that I have, what is it we want to see learners when, what we want to see learners see, which that's wrong, sorry. What is it we want to see learners doing in this task, or when we see learners doing, okay. So what is it we want to see learners doing? Can you give me some answers to that? I'm going to put in a little asterisk here to separate, okay. So. What is that? What do you want to see when you're looking at the learners in this midst of this task? Great. Okay. So we've got um, uh, things that are a little closer now because we're looking specifically at the type of task. I see great words like respectfully. I see turn taking, sharing opinions. On target, really important, right? Because you know how quickly in a situation like this, uh, it's easy to go off task. OK, and then let me ask you yet another answer. Oops, not the eights, the asterisks, Jamie. <laughs> OK, now underneath my next set of asterisks, let's answer that second question. What does a successful outcome for this task look like? What, do, what will we see as a result of learners having done this? Great, great response. Yes, Susan, I think that's, that's a really important element. Ownership, pride. Debbie Jensen, if you notice that I am responding to people's uh, comments much against our concept in the questioning course, it's because we're in a webinar and I want to make sure that everybody is taking note. But I know that in a, a real life setting, I would be writing these down and not commenting. Okay, these are great lists. You have done yourselves proud. Okay, I'm going to wait till Rana and Peggy finish. Do I have anybody else join that one? I'm going to push it over here. Yes, okay, so great. I'm going to push that over here. Oops. And then for the rest of you, OK, what are the elements or components of collaboration? So I've put down consensus building. Go ahead and write in. Elizabeth has already started. I'm going to make, uh, Cece, I'm going to close up the one that you're in. Guys, you're working on the other one now, not this one. <laughs> Don't look on the right-hand side. Go look on the left-hand side. I know it's a little confusing. OK, so these then become elements that you have to consider when you develop your rubric. All right, I'm going to have to do some funny uh, juggling with the, all of these will come to you. You'll get uh, copies of all of the reflections. So don't worry if things look very small and you cannot see them at this time. You will be seen. Let me show you an example of
this is a whiteboard and we can I can write in here based on some of what you've said let me Saw the rubric. I know you did. Sometimes those little questions do not grab me. Oh. For label one, would you agree, give me a, a Y or an N, would you agree that participation is an important element in this task? I'll put the task over here. Yes or no? I think the sound trouble was probably while I was trying to get this to, to load. We are, we are not worried about the, um, the reflection too right now. As I mentioned, we're, we're moving on to something else. I know some of you are still typing and it's hard to see. So it should be over in the chat pod. I know it's tricky going to so many different pods. This is an important thing in my own rubric for myself. I will give myself needs improvement on managing chat pods. OK. Now everybody should be looking over to the right. So if I have a participation, then I can, I can say that all team members is maybe my top. Most team members is maybe my, my mid-range. And few team members is my nightmare. One of the other things that you came up with as part of the uh, a dimension that you came up with would be uh, turn taking. How is this measurable, Sharon? You're asking how is participation measurable? If I see that all team, so the students themselves, uh, I would have to write in the description. Right, Susan. Students measure it or I measure it as I'm walking around. I can see. If I say participation, all team members took one turn. There are ways in a brainstorm of making sure everybody participates. If you use round table writing where each person has, uh, the, the, the paper goes around the table and each person has to write and you see different handwriting, that's one way of assessing participation. Uh, it's also possible for the learners to say everybody on the team spoke, uh, three people spoke, two people spoke, one person spoke. So. What I'm showing you here, though, is that I start by having maybe three dimensions, maybe three labels. It's up to you. And then I start pulling in the content from my reflections. So I can do it uh, numerically, where I'm thinking it's all, most, and few. But I can also do it more quality um, and saying, uh, you know, the sentence, the, there were uh, um, original sentences. Uh, the sentences were pulled directly from the textbook. You know, there are ways of, of having it be the quality of the response being Just going to to show you an example of some rubrics so that you can see what we're talking about more specifically. So in a case, for example, where learners are creating a poster about saving energy, and the outcome is that the students are going to have this poster, they're going to work on it together, they're going to have to research three to five facts, and they're going to have to present. So my next step then is to consider 
what are the elements that go into doing that project. And I can, I can help me plan. So I can say in the middle is my criteria. The content of the poster, the design of the poster, the accuracy, the strat presentation strategies, and the teamwork. Now I haven't broken this down. I, you know, the teamwork could be, um, an, uh, you know, amazingly broken down into tiny little pieces. But I, I've chosen these five as my key dimensions of the task. And then I've gone in and I've identified my middle row is what meets the criteria. And either side is scale of up and down. So I don't necessarily have to um, have meets criteria, exceeds criteria, doesn't meet criteria. I can have different levels. For example, accomplish, proficient, developing. So S Susan, this is the, uh, you know, the holistic approach. So I have the, the learners seeing that what an accomplished poster project looks like, what a proficient poster project looks like, and what a developing poster project looks like. I can also treat this as a differentiated situation and assign uh, class levels to that. So a beginning literacy learner is going to take ready-made text and images and arrange them on the poster. And the presentation is going to be primarily that the, the learners are reading the labels and making eye contact. Elizabeth, that is exactly the point. The problem becomes, for non-native speakers, how we convey this amount of information, because it is a lot of information. So a lot of this has to get conveyed in simpler language. It also has, thanks Deborah, I think so too. It also has to get conveyed maybe visually as well. When, when we are working on a role play, for example, yes, Susan, you do, but, but as Dave says, it has to be bite-sized because it's really easy to get discouraged. Teachers get discouraged looking at rubrics. But uh, uh, breaking it down, making it simpler, doing a one-dimension rubric is a fantastic way to manage it. Just if you, if you just teach um, about, let me just adjust this, if you just teach the concept of uh, turn taking and what turn taking looks like. Happy faces are good. <laughs> uh, so this is an example of, of a rubric that I would use if I were working with the learners on developing a role play. Uh, again, this is, you know, pretty college and career readiness oriented. I've got the students doing very specific types of tasks. I've got language like request and state. But to guide the learners, I might simplify it. And this is what I was speaking about earlier. So it's just, I've, at this point, maybe I've just got best, good, almost there working on it. And, and you can see the language is pretty simplified. I can even simplify it further so that they're in I statements. Now, this is the one that I had showed you earlier, where the, there are I statements here for the student. And this is the holistic version with the I statements. I, again, I would recommend putting check boxes in here. And Sylvia, I agree with you 100%. Because rubrics make the qualitative quantitative, it's possible for you as an instructor to use highlighting and notes on a rubric to then present to the students as their evaluation. If we have a lot to do, if we have 30 students, 20 students, there are a lot of students to assess, this is a way for me to quickly identify the elements and highlight them for the students. And then it gives me a place for notes on the side. And I can just give the learner this card. But it, this gives me a really quick way to, this is where the time I put in up front saves me a lot of time in class. And it makes it really uh, meaningful for everyone in the classroom to do pair uh, speaking exercises. So I have a question for you. How would giving a rubric to groups at the start of a task help your learners work more effectively?
Okay, so I see that a lot of you are, are very clear on the value in presenting it. This is actually where all the higher level thinking comes in. There's a, that's not true, but a lot of it does. When students are talking about the, the rubric and determining what it is that's expected of them, that's when they start thinking about how they will achieve what the rubric is setting out for them. And then when they're in their groups, they remind each other. That's part of the facilitator's role is to have the rubric. And Susan, you bring up an excellent point because, in fact, that is exactly what we have. So Susan has said that we need an electronic community of practice. So let's go to our next steps and my fabulous animation. I want you all to just give me all the kudos I need for this fabulous animation. Are you ready? Here we go. So between now and September 19th, we have time to start setting up, talking about looking at things in our ECOP. And then you're going to be directed to here. Thank you so much. You're going to be directed to the CalPRO ECOP. I think, actually, you'll be invited to the CalPRO ECOP through an email from, from Catherine. But you can also, uh, you'll be able to click on the link in the handout. Thank you for the applause. And between now and the 19th, I won't be facilitating. I, I will put things in as I can, but I won't be facilitating. Starting the 19th, we will have formal discussions. But between now and then, you can go in and start discussing, showing examples of what you're doing, asking questions. You, if you've already uh, joined the ECOP, the CalPRO ECOP, you'll just log in. If you haven't, then they'll give you an opportunity to uh, sign up to join. As you can see, I'm watching you from up on top. So our job for the next two weeks, thereabouts, two and a half, is to reflect on this process and then apply it. And by apply it, I don't mean in the classroom yet. I mean to reflect, take that first step and reflect. Pick one task that you're going to have learners do and then apply this, the rubric steps to that. Then try it out. Then head on over to the ECOP and let us know what it is uh, you've done. You can certainly enter before the 19th. Um, thank you, Mimi. Uh, you can certainly enter before the 19th, but just know that before the 19th, it won't be officially facilitated. You know me. I'll be, uh, it'll be very hard for me to stay away, but I'm going to try. So how about if we just take a moment and think about what we're, where we've been <laughs> very quickly. Um, we've explored the workings of the analytic rubric. We've identified the steps in creating both teacher-generated and uh, learner-centered rubrics. We've analyzed an ESL team task. We started. Okay. Uh, Susan, I'm not sure what you mean. One whole month before we start? Yes. That has to do a lot with people, people's varying times getting into, uh, into classrooms and giving people time to settle in so that hopefully by the 19th, people have a good sense of exactly what Catherine's saying. People have a good sense of their classes and, and where they want to go. And we considered several management strategies that support the use of rubrics for learner self-assessment. Now, my, my personal goal was to also share with you the college and career readiness standards that's, that connect directly with rubrics. But I'm going to put that in the ECOP because that is a lot of text. And I decided that it was just too much to be reading on top of everything else. But I, I can tell you, and you can, you can verify, um, you can do college and career readiness with my statement. I assert that rubrics are the, an exact correlation to what we want learners to be able to do for the speaking and listening uh, college and career readiness standards one and two. And I will be sending those to the ECOP for you to look at. So, oops. You asked me if I wanted to delete something. I never want to delete things. If you would, CalPRO is looking to uh, collect information about the experience you've had today. And I'm just telling you that 
I know that you sometimes feel after a webinar that you're lost on this desert island. Thank you so much. <laughs> but the handout has links. There are ways, there are many rubrics already out there. Be careful because they don't necessarily uh, go to the ECOP CC. Um, the, there are many rubrics that are already made. I recommend making them because they will match your class's needs. And so before we say goodbye, if you could respond to at least one of the following questions, I would be ever so grateful. They're up in the chat pods. And thank you so, so much for spending a Friday with me. And it's been lovely. I give you all exceeds expectations in everything. As Catherine says, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jamie. Um, something um, that our audience needs to know is the ECOP, there, I believe Catherine sent out an email during the presentation, so you will have links to the ECOP. And if you happen to go in in the next hour, I will be ready to welcome you in as quickly as possible. Um, and hopefully we can get everyone in that would like to um, participate. Susan, Gare, you can get these files as soon as you get into the ECOP. Well, that's not entirely true. I have to go in and put the handout in there right now, and I have to send the, um, how about, let's say, 4 o'clock this afternoon. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Oh, guys, guess what I forgot? Oh, I can't believe I forgot this. This is what I worked on this morning <laughs> to show you. And I can't believe I forgot to show you. OK, here we go. This is on a little tiny whiteboard. Um, this is on a 6 by 8 whiteboard because I wanted to show you that it's possible to do a, a rubric completely visually. Thanks, Dave. So, <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. So uh, I sent this to Sylvia, and Sylvia's response to me was, you've had too much caffeine. But in fact, I had not. If I had had too much caffeine, there would have been many more dimensions to this. But what I, what I wanted to point out is that it is possible to make the concepts not as text heavy, uh, and you can draw them on the whiteboard with a few things. I highly recommend Norma Shapiro's book, Chalk Talks, to help you get some really quick symbolism. Oh, I'm so glad I remembered to tell you, show you. Jamie, this is Catherine. If I could just interrupt for a second and uh, give a great uh, big round of applause to you and great thanks. It was a tremendous webinar and I can see from the comments people are writing about what they got out of it and what they hope to apply. Um, it was really worthwhile for a lot of us. So thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you, Susan, for your tech support. Um, everybody participating on a Friday afternoon in the middle of August. It was uh, <clears throat> it was great to have you here and I hope you'll you'll carry on with us through the ECOP. Um, we will be uploading uh, these materials, those that aren't yet uploaded, uh, hopefully this afternoon or by the, certainly by Monday morning. Uh, the recording should be available by then and uh, Susan Coulter stands ready to admit you uh, if you're coming in in the next hour. Otherwise, basically you give us a day to, to respond to any uh, requests to enter and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Um, I also in the email just sent to you a few minutes ago mentioned an upcoming uh, separate uh, webinar hosted by Lori Howard and Sylvia Ramirez, two other ESL experts who are here in today's call. And um, so there's details about that webinar as far as the title and where to register, and we'll send you more info. So thank you very much, everyone. Round of applause to, <laughs> to the group. <laughs>